Okay, and with that, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to another virtual listening session held by the members of the Board of County Commissioners. I'm Dylan Blaylock with Clackamas County's Public and Government Affairs Department, and I'll be coordinating the public comments for today's meeting. If any attendees would like to provide a comment, you'll be provided to do so in a few minutes by me uh, by utilizing your raise hand feature on Zoom, but I will walk you through that. And if you're on the phone, I see we have uh, several phone listeners as well. I will go ahead and uh, let you know how to do that in a little bit as well. Today's topic is crime and justice in Clackamas County during and after coronavirus. Uh, today's listening session will go until two o'clock or until we run out of uh, comments and questions, whichever comes first. The session will be archived to YouTube after. This is an opportunity for commissioners and other county officials that are with us to hear directly from the public about your experiences and opinions. Joining us today are Commissioner Sonia Fisher, Commissioner Paul Savas, Sheriff Craig Roberts, Circuit Court Presiding Judge Kathy Steele, and Deputy District Attorney John Wentworth. I'll introduce each of our guest panelists in a moment to give their opening comments, but first I'll go to the two commissioners. Commissioner Fisher, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Dylan. I just really want to thank everyone for taking time to join us for this very important topic. Your county commission has really worked hard to make sure that we are accessible and listening to what the concerns are in our community. We've held a number of listening sessions and a virtual town hall. We think it is incredibly important that we hear directly from you about what your thoughts, ideas, concerns are. Today, we're going to be talking about public safety and our justice system. And so this, when you look at what is most important in our safety net system, making sure that everyone is safe is of the utmost importance, which is why we are wanting to have this session with you today. And with that, I will pass it on to Commissioner Savas. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Uh, and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, I won't repeat what my colleague just shared, uh, but we are uh, very committed to uh, listening. Uh, we're very committed to public safety and I um, uh, appreciate everyone joining in. Uh, we're gonna keep our comments really brief today. Um, if we don't respond to every question, it's basically because we wanna give as much opportunity for people to ask questions and hear and understand the pulse of what's happening in your community. So. Um, anyone who's seeking a question, we're probably going to log all those. We'll probably create um, frequently asked questions or FAQs. And if you leave any information, contact information, we can always get back to a question if it remains unanswered. So don't perceive that as a lack of response or not caring. Uh, we're just trying to listen to as many people in this one hour block of time as we can. So with that, I'll pass it on back to Dylan. All right, thank you very much for that, commissioners. I just want to bring in and give the chance for opening comments for all three of our guests as they are. Um, high-level officials from the county. First joining us is Sheriff Craig Roberts. Craig was sworn in as the Sheriff of Clackamas County in 2005, but has been re-elected to the office ever since. He was born and raised in Clackamas County. During his time at the Sheriff's Office, he has been involved with the creation of numerous programs and initiatives, including the Children's Center, a Safe Place Family Justice Center, and the Clackamas County Interagency Task Force, which combats illegal drug trafficking. Sheriff Roberts, would you like to give uh, some quick open comments? Well, let's start off, uh, Dylan, thanks so much for the invite. And uh, I, I just want to kick it off by saying really to our frontline staff that are just doing an amazing job. My thanks to them. They've been putting in tremendous hours and uh, uh, my heartfelt thanks, first of all, goes out to them. Second of all, I, I want to make sure that people are aware that um, the sheriff's office is really on top of what's going on. Uh, we have daily statewide calls. Uh, we have uh, regular calls with the governor staff. We've been on a number of calls with the White House uh, to include uh, Vice President Pence uh, and the president and paying attention to what's happening outside Oregon and trying to prepare for uh, if the uh, pandemic increased here in Oregon. So we've been working hard to prepare for that. Um, I'm uh, proud to say in our jail that we do not have an inmate. Uh, 
that has tested positive for COVID-19. We've been doing a great job keeping that out of our jail um, and directly really, I believe, related to the recently opening of our 26 uh, medical beds, which couldn't have came at better timing. So um, uh, we have seen increase in uh, some areas of crime, but um, we'll talk a little bit later about kind of the things that we're, that we're seeing. And um, uh, what, on the statewide level, we are paying very close attention to the number of frontline police officers that are testing positive for COVID-19 and making sure that there's resources to keep that frontline staff uh, ready to respond to calls. So thanks for the invite again today, Dylan. All right. Thank you, Sheriff Roberts. Uh, next up, we have Clackamas County Circuit Court presiding Judge Kathy Steele. She's been judging in Clackamas County Municipal Courts since 1983 and has been a full-time judge in Clackamas County Circuit Court since 2007. In that capacity, she was the adult drug court, the mental health court, and the hope court judge for seven years until becoming presiding judge two years ago, where now she controls the docket and trial assignments amongst the judges. Judge Steele, any opening comments from you? And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank you also for the invitation and um, a thank you and shout out to all the folks that are working really hard in the courthouse and for the folks at the jail and the sheriff's office and the district attorney's office to help us deal with this difficult time. Basically, we've had to adapt a bunch of different um, procedures in the courthouse that allows us to deal with um, important or essential uh, functions of the courthouse, and we are doing that in a different way that is new to all of us, new to the judges, new to the folks that live here. It was important um, that we get as many people out of the courthouse because it's tough to social distance. We're experiencing and enforcing social distancing at the courthouse, but um, that can be difficult, and so we have reduced as much as we can by following the governor's orders and the chief justice's orders regarding level three restrictions. So I can talk about that specifically when we get to it, but um, I would urge anybody that has any questions about it though, to get on our website because we do have all the presiding judge orders and the chief justice orders there for their review. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Steele. Okay, and last but certainly not least, we have John Wentworth with us. He is the Chief Deputy District Attorney where he supervises the Domestic Violence and Vulnerable Adult Unit, as well as all of our specialty courts, including mental health, uh, DUII, drug court, and the Domestic Violence Deferred Sentencing Program. He's been a prosecutor for over 25 years and has tried lots of cases from DUIs to aggravated murder. Most recently, he's been involved with the office and the court's response to the COVID crisis. Uh, John, would you like to go ahead and, and give any comments? Thank you, Dylan. Uh, much like uh, Judge Steele and uh, Sheriff Roberts have shared, we are uh, so proud of our uh, staff who have taken this very difficult uh, circumstance and worked and collaborated with uh, partners like the Sheriff's Office, other law enforcement agencies, the courts, the defense bar, and have been as nimble and uh, quick to adjust to very difficult situations um, as we possibly could be. Uh, this is, as you know, a new frontier for all of us. And and the, the degree to which this has been almost seamless, not perfect, but almost seamless, is a credit to everyone who came together and tried to make this work. Um, we are fortunate in the DA's office that a few years ago, we decided to go to a model where we are uh, fileless, not paperless, but fileless meaning that much of the work we do, because we can do it online, we can file cases online, we can um, review police reports online, we've been able to uh, work substantially remotely to maximize social distancing within our office and within the courthouse. As Judge Steele was sharing, the courthouse uh, for the size of our county is, uh, to put it kindly, intimate, uh, it's very difficult to keep your distance from people because of our closed quarters. Uh, so it's been critical that we keep as many employees off-site as we possibly can and allow for those people in the public who come in and have to deal with our, their, their business in the courthouse have as much social, social distancing as possible. And anyone who's been to the courthouse will note that many of the, um, the court staff has set out 
uh, markers on the floor, for example, to make sure that people keep their distance and, and can respect others' uh, distance as well. In the DA's office, we have um, we have basically what I would call a skeleton crew in the in the courthouse itself, so that we make sure that we can continue to carry out the the court functions that we have to carry out, including in custody matters. But all of our other functions are being carried out remotely, and uh, so we're very fortunate to be able to have that. I don't know that every county has that ability, and so I, I think it may be one of the reasons why. Uh, Certainly Clackamas County in Oregon has been one of the safest places in the nation and, and uh, it's a credit to the work that everyone's doing. All right, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, District Attorney Wentworth, Deputy District Attorney Wentworth, and thanks everybody again for joining us. I see we have 64 attendees right now. Now is the time to go ahead and we're going to open it up for questions. I'll do the first one in a second. But uh, if, you are, uh, if you are out there and you would like to go ahead and pose a question or relay your comment or experience, please go ahead and utilize the raise hand function on Zoom. Again, that is you are going to be located usually on the Zoom bar on the bottom or top of your Zoom app, depending on your interface, depending on your device. Or if you're on the phone, you can go ahead and hit star nine. Again, on the phone, that's star nine, and that goes ahead and lets me know that you have raised um, a hand. But I will start it off with one question that we've gotten over email um, a, a little bit since we started promoting this. And the first one is, um, uh, you know, we, we're talking about the, the possible rise in crime that we've seen recently with some stats. Can you give us an idea on the differences in criminal activity reports that we've experienced since the beginning of the pandemic? Maybe some stats on what we're dealing with. It's a good question. I thought first we would go to, um, to Sheriff Roberts uh, to maybe talk a little bit about exactly what we have seen an uptick in um, versus what we have not. Sheriff. Yeah, you bet, Dylan. Hey, um, in, in looking at some of our data, um, sadly, uh, just comparing March of uh, this year to March of last year, we've actually seen a 16% increase in domestic violence calls. Uh, we've also seen a 13% uh, increase um, as compared to last year in uh, mental health calls for service. And one of the uh, calls w that we've seen, which to me is, has been alarming, has an increase in uh, burglary calls. And so about a 43% increase uh, where we're kind of seeing that as uh, uh, businesses that uh, perhaps are vacant, not necessarily residential, but um, a significant increase there. We're uh, yeah, concentrating patrol in those particular high risk areas. Uh, the other thing that we've really seen, and it, it, it has increased, I would say, gradually, but, uh, and that has to do with uh, driving behavior, has seen a dramatic increase in uh, poor driving. The, um, just to give you an idea, uh, there were two weeks in March where we actually saw careless driving increase by 183%. Uh, we have moved a, a lot of individuals uh, actually to uh, enforcement and we're, we're not talking about enforcement of, you know, uh, five, ten miles over the speed limit. Uh, what we've seen is 77% um, increase in citations for uh, 20 miles over the speed limit. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, citations for driving over 100 miles an hour. We've also uh, seen a 20% increase in reckless driving. So we are out there citing individuals. I think that's uh, something we want the public to make sure that, that they know we are uh, enforcing traffic laws with a particular focus on reckless and careless driving. And also just to emphasize, we've also seen an increase in, in DUI arrests. So those are uh, in general, some of the uh, increases, there's been some others, but th those are some of the high highlights. Okay, thank you very much for that. That was good to sort of set um, the, the conversation. So again, if you have a comment and you're out there as an attendee, you can raise your hand on Zoom, or if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine. Uh, first, we're going to bring in uh, the Scott Edwards. Um, Scott, if you want to go ahead and, as you have your hand raised, if you want to unmute yourself and then go right ahead and uh, give your comment or pose a question. Yeah, this would be a question uh, concerning cybercrime uptick. Um, I've noticed uh, a number of increases in 
Uh, for example, I've actually received a ransom demand via email uh, just yesterday. Uh, does the county have any kind of a cyber crime unit where these things can be reported and, and researched? Hmm. Does anyone want to take that? I do not know of one. Um, if I can address that, uh, Dylan. And uh, um, the first thing I want to just tell you is that, that we do have a uh, individual assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force where they uh, focus on, on that. Also, there's what's called RCFL, which is a FBI task force that we also participate on, which is really internet related crime. So. Um, one of the things you can actually call the sheriff's office and ask that we forward that to the FBI uh, that focuses on that. Uh, we do some of the larger uh, cases, but um, uh, uh, so I would just encourage you to call uh, basically the sheriff's office. We'll, we can take a report on that and forward it to the FBI who actually we have folks on those task forces. Okay, thank you very much for that. And thank you for the question, Scott. Next, we will bring in, it looks like I'm sorry, I'm not going to say the right name here, but the, or the right pronunciation, Trey Slyapitch, Sly, Slypitch maybe. Um, Trey, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, um, and you're going to be on. So cool. go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious what your guys' thoughts are on um, inmates during the COVID pandemic, how inmates in jails and prisons are being treated during this. Um, seen a lot of articles come out about inmates talking about the environment they're having to deal with in there, like a lack of soap or people patting them down, not wearing gloves and just not having the right information being passed on to them. And um, we just know there's a lot of inmates and I'm just curious if any of you have thought about or had conversations that include them and where they're at during all of this, or if any of you could speak to that. Yeah, I, it probably lands in, in my shop a little bit there. So um, I guess, first of all, that's a, Trey, that's a great question. And honestly, that was a major concern for me from day one as it started to hit because I saw jails across the country that uh, had inmates that had COVID-19 and it spread wildly. So um, I just want to tell you, first of all, Sarah Present um, is uh, – um, um, one of the doctors that we work very closely with that's responsible for Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas County. We've been really following a lot of her direction and advice, which she's also getting from the CDC. And um, I, I want to tell you about the things that we have done. Early on, we actually had a, uh, a potential case, which um, really put us in a tailspin and trying to get ready. And on one hand, it was a blessing because this was long before it had really um, uh, gone the way it has throughout the United States. We implemented a lot of things from uh, early on, one of which is we're following the best standard practices that hospitals are using. So nobody comes into that jail crossing a threshold to the jail that is, does not have their temperature taken and also a screening. And if they do come across or come into our jail, they're also kind of quarantined for a period of time before we put them in general population to ensure that perhaps they don't test positive when they come in, but they develop it days later. So we have that, uh, that period. Second of all, we've uh, given all inmates uh, masks that are washable, that uh, they are washed daily. And, um, the other thing that we've worked with uh, John Wentworth, who's done an amazing job, and uh, Kathy Steele with the courts is, is really trying to minimize uh, the people that we have in there. We're really trying to keep just those high-risk offenders and uh, lower-level offenders. We're trying to either you know book and release, sign and release, and do really minimize our risk to every possibility that we can. And um, uh, John, I don't know if you have any comments, but we sure appreciate the work of the courts and the DA's office on this. Thank you, Sheriff. Yeah, uh, I've spoken to Captain Eby uh, in detail about the actions that the Sheriff's office is taking. And what the Sheriff is referring to, of course, is that many of the offenders who uh, let's say before the COVID outbreak uh, ha had been brought to the jail, likely would have been lodged at the jail. And many of those inmates are now being um, 
cited and released for a future appearance in front of the court. We're holding uh, the most dangerous offenders, uh, the most likely to reoffend. And in speaking to Captain Eby, we're actually down to close to where there's one inmate per cell. So a lot of social distancing is occurring within the jail. The jail is taking, in my view, extraordinary precautions to ensure that uh, COVID is not brought into the facility and that it's properly dealt with once it's, you know, should it, should it enter. We've been very fortunate at the jail uh, in that regard. Uh, there, there are a number of measures in place and um, I've been very comfortable and satisfied to hear uh, what, what's being done at the jail to ensure that everyone, including the staff, stays healthy. Okay, great, thank you both very much for that and thank you for the question, Trey. Um, I see we only have one more hand raised right now. So if you're out there and you want to ask a question, um, again, hit the raise hand button on your Zoom bar, or if you're on the phone, uh, it's star nine. I'll bring in the, the person who has their hand raised on the phone in just a second, but we did get a lot of email questions ahead of time. I'd like to bring one in now. This one was offline, it came from uh, Garrett. I received a summon for jury duty just last week for May 19th. Do I still need to take action or is this just an automatic thing? Um, I guess, is that is that you, Judge? I think that's me. Okay. It's uh, not automatic. We are required to try certain cases for folks that are in custody. We have a constitutional right to have a speedy trial. That being said, we don't, we're not trying very many of them. And some of them are getting reset and some of them, uh, because witnesses and parties are either ill or at high risk of being ill. Um, and some of them are working things out before it actually has to go to trial. So that's happening a lot as well. But we do have procedures in place for trying cases and how we can utilize social distancing for all the potential jurors, et cetera. So, um, Everything is in place. We know we can do it. We've not actually had to do it, but we know we can do it. We know that other counties have been uh, having jury trials. We're all learning from each other and sharing that information. And so, yeah, if you get a jury summons, then you need to assume that it's going to happen. It may go away. You will know as you follow the directions on that summons to call. And if they don't need you, they'll tell you. But assume that it'll happen until uh, you know otherwise on the telephone. And if you as a juror are at very high risk and are concerned about being in the building as well, then you can write and request a uh, continuance for your service at a later time. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. That's good info. Okay, next we're going to bring in the caller on the phone. I do not have anything as far as a handle for you, caller, except that you're last digits are 892. So if that is you and you've raised your hand and you are on, so please, uh, if you could give your name and uh, your comment or question, please, thank you. My name is Steve, thanks for having me. My question okay. is for Sheriff Roberts. First, I wanted to thank you for your shall issue stance on concealed handgun licenses and your respect for the Second Amendment. While issuance of the new CH, I'm sorry, while issuance of new CHLs is suspended, what prevents Clackamas County from reverting to constitutional carry? Thank you. Dylan, I couldn't hear the very last part of his question. I heard CHL. Um, I, I might, am I still on? Yes, you can go ahead. While issuance of new CHLs is suspended, what prevents Clackamas County from reverting to constitutional carry? So he's saying what, what, what's keeping the county from reverting to constitutional carry? Correct, while new CHLs are not being issued. Okay. Yeah, I think that, um, I, I guess I would focus on uh, the issuance of CHLs and, and our goal to get uh, that back open as soon as possible. Obviously, one of the key things within the CHL is the fingerprint process. And um, so there was an extension for those existing members uh, because of COVID-19, how we were extending that, um, uh, the um, the goal for us is to get that open as soon as we can and is, is one of the focuses that, that obviously we're trying to get done. And I just would mention that some of the things that the governor's 
um, plan to reopen things that um, we're taking a look at how that impacts us and, and the ways that we can uh, do the safe distancing, but also accomplish uh, getting those, those fingerprints so that we can process things, uh, folks through. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next, we're gonna go, and thank you for the call, uh, Stephen. Uh, next, we're gonna go to Jan Lindstrom. So let me bring in Jan here. And Jan, if you can unmute yourself and you are on if you wanted to give your comment. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. It's really great. Uh, this is probably for Sheriff Roberts. I have seen a little bit more graffiti popping up in the unincorporated area where I live in Oak Grove. Um, I know there is a sheriff's program that allows homeowners to give access to the department um, to quickly uh, cover over that graffiti. Um, there is one place I've seen on River Road that doesn't seem to be getting covered up and then more tags come and more tags come and, and then we look like we have a gang problem and that's not good. So I was wondering if you could remind everyone what that program is called and how we go about getting on that or let other homeowners or land on, uh, you know, landlords know about it. Yeah, well, one of the programs that we have, which I'm really excited about, and it's it's kind of been on put on hold for right now, and our goal is to get that back as soon as we can. And it's something we take a lot of pride in uh, in Clackamas County is is keeping our county free of graffiti. Um, our community corrections program has a team that literally. Uh, outside of the COVID-19 basically goes out literally almost every day and addresses graffiti throughout this county and, and it's our goal to address it early on. I believe so much in the broken window theory. I know John Wentworth and I've talked about that is that if we allow one particular area to really have people garbage pile up, um, graffiti, it really uh, brings down that part of our county and is, is something that I, I strongly believe in that, that we need to work together to keep it clean. So calling our community corrections program uh, and or calls through our transition center, we take those calls, they're signed out and uh, our goal is to get out there to um, get that cleaned up as, as quickly as possible. So I'm, I'm hopeful we'll be back in action soon, but that's one of the things that was temporarily suspended. Uh, Deputy DA Wentworth, you have your hand up. Uh, you know, I'm going to take the opportunity, Dylan, if that's okay, that I, I want to segue a little bit from Jan's question because she's bringing up a topic that is uh, obvious in the community. And I, I just I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking today to, to the people who are uh, listening and watching uh, about something they might not be seeing that we see uh, substantially, and that is a rise in domestic violence. The sheriff touched on this a little bit, and I wanted to report out that uh, my office has seen a 60% increase in the number of domestic violence cases that we, that, that we received in this last month compared to what we normally see in March. That is a giant increase in domestic violence, and I want to bring that up because that's not what the public sees. Oftentimes, domestic violence occurs in, uh, in, in private, in a home. Uh, as does child abuse. We're not seeing an increase in reported child abuse. The people who are, who are listening, who are involved in law enforcement, will not be surprised by that. Uh, kids are at home. They're not uh, around adults who can act on, on uh, what's occurring to them. And to, to kind of foreshadow, Dylan, what you're probably going to bring up a little later is, what do we expect to see down the road? And I think we're going to see a giant increase in reported uh, child abuse once kids start returning back to school, they start engaging in sports and being around adults who are there that they feel secure around. But uh, I want people to know that the resources that are there for domestic violence victims, the resources that were there for child abuse victims are still here. Uh, the domestic, the, the DV, the uh, my unit is open, the DA's office is open, Clackamas Women's Services is open, uh, law enforcement is still responding to domestic violence and probably it, my, my guess from looking at the in custody sheet is probably one of the highest calls they're getting right now. And uh, I just don't want anyone to come away from this conversation believing that uh, they, they perhaps are losing some protection that they had before. We're, we're open for business and willing to help in any, any way we can. Uh, it, we're, unfortunately, we're just seeing 
a greater number. And if I can speak anecdotally, I think the severity of the violence that we're seeing has also increased. And that gives me a great deal of concern. Okay, hey, thank you very much for, for that to both of you. Um, if you, again, if you're an attendee and you have a question, we are trying to limit it to one question per attendee. Um, uh, just for time and for getting through things. If you have a question, please go ahead and uh, hit the raise uh, hand feature, or you can, if you're on the phone, star nine. Um, next. Uh, Dil like Dylan, I did want to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I missed that. Go right ahead. I do want to respond to the caller's question. I appreciate uh, John's comments about domestic violence. It's a very uh, serious concern, and we take that uh, take that to heart. And um, I know that everyone um, on the panel here today, including my colleagues on the commission, takes domestic violence uh, very seriously. But shifting back to the caller's question about graffiti, if you go to the county's website and on the search bar, just type in graffiti, you'll see um, a, a, a five bulleted um, contact, means of contacting the county. Uh, one, if it's in progress, you're obviously calling the sheriff's office um, uh, on a couple of them. Uh, but we also have a, a mail in graffiti location. And if you can send in a photo with it, it's at graffiti at clackamas.us is the email address. And there's also a call line uh, to, uh, to text. And that's 971-337-7769. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, next, we're gonna go, oh, shoot. That question, uh, Brian, if you are still there, please raise your hand again. Um, we can go ahead and bring in one of the offline questions real quickly. Is there an emphasis on prosecuting only high level felonies right now? If so, will that continue in the future? I, the answer to that is yes, by necessity. As I mentioned, uh, I, law enforcement has substantially re, um, adjusted the types of crimes that they're investigating. Um, you know, with the, the types of crimes that we'd normally see, which someone might call lower level, for example, for example, shoplifting, has probably practically gone away because so few stores are open right now. That leaves higher risk, higher danger, higher lethality cases that we're currently dealing with. And so the, the cases that Judge Steele was telling you about that we're currently trying are cases where someone is being held in custody, probably because they are uh, very serious crimes. That will change, I expect, when stores start to open back up, when uh, public starts mingling once again. As I was mentioning earlier, once kids get back to school, uh, I think we're gonna see um, a huge increase in reported crime. Uh, not just from what we normally see, but in addition to what's you know what's occurred because of COVID. So uh, the the short answer is yes, but for a lot of different reasons. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Brian did raise his hand again, so I can go ahead and bring him in. It's Brian, either Mar or Mayor. So just one second, Brian. Okay, Brian, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, and then you are on with the panel. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Brian Maher, uh, here in West Lynn. Um, had a couple of uh, questions, I guess. Uh, I was curious if we have some line of sight on when we're going to be able to open the Family Justice Center open again with uh, domestic violence up, uh, what, 16%. Um, that's a critical piece for us to connect with. Blackness Women's Services, and we're all interconnected there. So I'm just curious about when, if there's a line of sight, uh, when we can open that back up. And then probably for commissioners, um, Paul or Sonia, I don't know if there's any future discussion about uh, the courthouse, the new courthouse. Is there a line of sight on what's going to happen with that? Uh, so my two comments, questions. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I know that everything is always under evaluation when you go through a major crisis. So I would say that we absolutely need a new courthouse in Clackamas County. And we are planning to move ahead. But if we move ahead as quickly as we would have liked before this, that, that ha that's up for future discussion. And Paul, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. 
Yeah, I, I would add, Brian, uh, thanks for calling, by the way. Um, I would add that uh, we've got, I believe, uh, Chair Bernard indicated that the state or the governor is going to give us an extension on meeting the deadline to um, uh, proceed forward with that. So be, because of this, uh, this crisis that we're in. So that uh, we're not really kicking the can, but uh, essentially we're not, that's going to be deferred until a later date. So that's not urgent. I think you're probably your most um, uh, important question out of the two is probably when will we be able to open the Family Justice Center? Because I'm already kind of very concerned about the people that are going to the door and not find anyone there. Um, I know there's signage there and I know that they can call in. I know that um, uh, Clackers Women's Services uh, and, and everyone's doing uh, everything they can to, uh, to work remotely and to, to, to take care of the calls. So I guess it's gonna be uh, the commissioners we have discussed even this morning, how we go back to work. And I guess go back to work for the private sector, go back to work for the county. Um, but we're still waiting to see a, uh, a decline um, in the number of cases and have the um, uh, adequate supply of personal protection equipment like masks and so forth, so that all of our employees and all the employees in the private sector and peace, people coming through the door are um, in a safe environment. Thank you. Uh, Deputy uh, District Attorney Wentworth. Thank you. If I can tag on to that, just for people who, who are listening who don't know, the Family Justice Center is a is a organization that's located uh, on the hill in Oregon City uh, that is designed to provide uh, a, a number of services to victims of domestic violence or sex and or sexual assault. Uh, there are agencies there like the Sheriff's Office, the District Attorney's Office, Clackamas Women's Services, Adult Protective Services, and many others who are collaborating to have all the services that, uh, or at least many of the services that a victim might need under one roof, so they don't have to run around the county going to all these different places. All those services that I've just mentioned are still doing their work, but unfortunately having all those agencies under one roof uh, in a time of social distancing has become difficult. And that's why we've closed the Family Justice Center. And I'm about to share something with Judge Steele that I haven't even had the chance to talk to her about. And that is, uh, I've already begun conversations about whether and when we can open the Family Justice Center in a phase in process and what that might look like. And the reason I'm looking to Judge Steele is that she doesn't know that one of those things may be that we want to speak to the court about uh, having reopening some some version of video court that we've had as a service to uh, victims of domestic violence and what that might look like. So I don't mean to blind side her, but uh, th th those are the kinds of conversations that we're having about, you know, how can we be how can we be creative to continue to provide services to, to crime victims in a way that gives them what they need, but continues to keep everyone safe. And, and we're, we're in that discussion right now. Chair, if I will go to you in a second, but since the question was put to Judge Steele, Judge Steele, if you want to respond, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one, of course, we'll take what you can give us from the Family Justice Center as soon as you can give it to us. In the meantime, uh, I do note that we are encouraging people and we have procedures in place where they can do much of their requesting for restraining orders and that type of matter uh, remotely. That being said, I also note that a lot of people that don't have the capacity to do that remotely are doing it in person in the courthouse. That is the one docket per day that I can guarantee to you that has more people in a courtroom. And we have it in the biggest courtrooms we have available. And there are X's on the uh, benches so that you are far enough away from everybody else when you are waiting for a judge to call upon you. But we are doing those in person now and there also are procedures in place and advertised on our website about how to do it remotely. All right, thank you for that, Judge. Uh, Sheriff, you, uh, you had your hand up, maybe involving yeah, your family. Yeah, Justice thanks, Dylan. Right. And uh, Brian, great question. One of the things that you wanted to point out, just that uh, uh, as many of you know, the Family Justice Center is packed solid with people. In fact, we worked for about two years to get a trailer, a portable modular parked in the back just to meet the demand of services. So I, I just want to caution everybody, one of the big issues we're facing is, is, is making sure that our staff are not down 
from COVID, which can have a really devastating rippling effect where there's literally no services. Um, and what I would strongly encourage too is just that survivors out there is that there's a lot of great work that goes on with safety planning, resources, housing, a lot of that stuff can that we can help you by calling. So I, while the building may be shut at this particular time, I, I can't encourage you enough to call and work with the amazing staff from Clackamas Women's Services and, and on a lot of the other programs that we partner with. The second big issue that, that we're also struggling with on the public safety element is not just PP&Es, but the burn rate of PP&Es and being able to keep up with the supply that uh, the context that we have. And so that's one of the challenges that we're really having right now is uh, um, I can tell you that um, uh, being actively involved in getting Oregon uh, PP&Es and falling where they're at. I mean, they're going as far away as Dubai to get supplies. So uh, we are really looking everywhere. And I can tell you at times we've actually had a handle on major supplies and it was suddenly snatched away from us by the federal government. So we are working hard to keep up with that. Um, I just want to say it, ha it has been a challenge. So thank you. All right, thank you all for that. And thanks again to Brian for the question. I see there are more hands up, so we'll get through uh, a bunch of these. Next up is gonna be Jerry Cohen. Jerry, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and you are on, uh, go ahead. Hi there, oh, I, uh, two things. One, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, the court system, law enforcement and the DA's office. I've been serving on the grand jury since March 1. And um, I, I know I put in chat a question of will and when there may be more uh, impaneled uh, uh, new grand jury. But in the meantime, I, it's been a privilege and an honor to see how you've all come together and done a, a very professional job under very, very uh, challenging circumstances. So that was a, a shout out. The two questions and, and, and uh, Deputy DA uh, uh, Wentworth hit it uh, on uh, domestic violence without going into obviously confidential information. It's it's, it's clear that uh, we're seeing more and more of a spike. And I'm wondering to what extent can we start to look at promoting uh, volunteer uh, victim advocates, because uh, we're gonna see a lot more of that. And also thinking of the vulnerable adults, uh, many more scams already taking place among uh, seniors and other vulnerable populations. So uh, I'll leave those two questions for you to answer. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, so. The, uh, the answer to your second question is, uh, it, I have some of the same concern, because as I said, I supervise our domestic violence and vulnerable adult unit. So some of the scams that you're talking about come to my unit and we, I know exactly what you're talking about. But you're talking about things that people know about, so that, that you know, we're, we all get these calls that we know there's something up about it. And, and um, you know, I know I'm, I know I'm not gonna get arrested from, by the social security, uh, social service, security agency or anything like that. Um, but I'm also concerned about the forms of financial exploitation that may be going on that isn't getting reported because people are housed with the person who's taking advantage of them or they're only seeing the person who is taking advantage of them. I think we will see an increase in those reports probably towards the end of the year. And I'm, I'm saying that assuming there isn't a second wave of COVID, all right? So um, I have deep concerns about this. I know that our law enforcement is, uh, they're looking down the line also at these same issues. It's not just my office. We have these conversations and uh, we're gonna have to work on addressing that as, they, as it comes along. Um, to your first question about uh, domestic violence volunteers, uh, I wanna, uh, you're my new best friend for asking that question because uh, the Clackamas DA's office has a volunteer program. Uh, we have a, a new class of about 40 pe people every year. And uh, we're always excited to have people who are willing to come on and help us out and, and, and do good work on behalf of crime victims. So uh, if anyone's interested, please feel free to reach out to our office. And, uh, and if that's not your bag, if you wanna help uh, senior citizens, we'll put you in touch with the groups that do that. Uh, you know, We're not the only ones who, who can use help. So. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Was that a hand that I saw, Judge Steele? I couldn't tell. It was. Okay, thank you. Yep. I just wanted to uh, extend my thanks to Jerry 
and everybody else on the grand jury panel, because normally those last about an hour, uh, a month. You're on a grand jury panel for about a month. And when COVID-19 hit, we were looking at a new month and how are we gonna bring people into the courthouse? And we had many, many, many folks from the grand jury panel who said, I'll stay on for another month. And so you don't have to worry about bringing new jurors into the building and going through their training. And then we have several folks from the current panels that are uh, willing to stay for another month through May. So it has uh, reduced the exposure. We're taking steps to make sure that the folks that are on those panels are safe while they're here and taking care of business. But um, we were incredibly pleased and impressed with so many folks that were willing to stay on. So thanks. All right, thank you for that. And thank you for the call. Uh, we still have a few calls to get through. Again, if you are an attendee and you'd like to pose a question, just hit the raise hand function on Zoom, or if you're on the phone, it's star nine. Uh, next, I'm gonna bring in another person who is on the phone. I don't have the handle, but the last three numbers are 566. If that is you, please go ahead. Hi, Sheriff Roberts. My name is Kristen. Um, so I am, in regards to the domestic violence issue we were talking about, I'm a woman who would like to get a concealed handgun license. How do I get fingerprinted for that? I assume that uh, criminals are still being fingerprinted as they enter the justice system. And I'm wondering what threat I pose as a law abiding citizen to be able to be fingerprinted. Thank you. So first of all, a great question. The one thing I'd point out right up front is um, that you don't provide any threat to get a concealed handgun license. Our concern really is um, of calling of fall, is, is really following the guidelines of what the governor's put out and really critical course services of what we're trying to do as far as keep individuals to stay at home and stay safe right now. And um, uh, that it's our goal, as I've mentioned, is to open that up as soon as we can. I anticipate that is going to be relatively soon and would we'll just ask for your patience so that we can make sure that we're doing everything to keep everybody safe, you, um, you know, the uh, worst case, you know, if we had a staff that passed it on to you, obviously, um, in some cases, that's a death sentence. And so we're just asking for folks to be patient that following recommendations from the doctors that we consult with on a regular basis about trying to keep everybody healthy. Um, uh, having a CHL I know is very important to a lot of people and we wanna support that effort and just asking for patience uh, so that we can open up business to get that done relatively soon. All right, thank you very much for that. And thanks again for the question. Next up is gonna be Larry. Kirk, Larry Kirk, if you can unmute yourself and then you are on with the panel. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you, each and every one of your time. But my uh, question basically is probably directed to Sheriff Roberts. You know, um, you mentioned earlier in the call that the increase in in um, calls, you know, to your office were domestic violence and um, you know traffic violations. You know, these are probably, you know, two of the most dangerous, you know, kind of situations for your road people to be involved in. Has there been any other safety or reminders, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, to protect, you know, your um, most valuable resources, your, you know, deputies? Thank you. Well, first of all, and Thank you so much for the concern you have for our frontline folks. And um, we are trying to do everything that we can to keep our frontline staff healthy. Um, a couple things I, I would want to talk about is that first of all, on the traffic offenses, you will, you will see that we're not out stopping people for expired tags. There's been some leniency on the state level to uh, grace periods on that, low level violations. So we're, uh, the threshold that we're really looking at is really life safety. And so if somebody's driving careless under the influence, those are truly life safety issues and um, that that's why my thanks goes out to our staff that they, they're stepping out and putting them 
themselves at a risk, just uh, having a traffic stop alone. But it's weighing the protection of our community so that um, the citations on those higher level stuff have, have skyrocketed. I did want to tell you what we have done to protect um, the frontline police officer and their families is we, we took a look at actually in New York, I mean, 50 FBI agents got COVID-19 uh, in a pretty short period of time. Their entire law enforcement agency was devastated. And so things that we have implemented is, is we actually have a facility set up. If you test positive for COVID-19 and you're a law enforcement officer, that we have a place for you to go so that you're not gonna go home and contaminate your family. Um, and we have medical staff that are available to check, come and check on those individuals. We also set up, I mean, we're not, we're not talking elaborate, we're talking cots. We've also set up facilities that if somebody does not wanna go home and contaminate their family and they're serving our community each and every day, we have a place where they can uh, sleep uh, go back to work the next day. And we've also worked with county parks to create a particular park where if they want, they can take their RV to. So we're really trying to prioritize ways that we can keep our frontline services safe. I can tell you, I've seen where it's been devastating across the country to lose frontline police officers. And it is a critical thing that we need to be very cognitive of. I can tell you right now, there's about 17 positive uh, COVID uh, law enforcement officers in the state of Oregon. We watch those numbers closely. One of the areas that also gave me concern is a, a lot of dispatchers actually uh, had concern that, um, that they had uh, contracted COVID-19. And you gotta remember that's another critical service that we so much rely on. So we're paying very close attention and we have a lot of plans in place in the event that uh, things get worse. I do see uh, a a positive side and I think we're moving in a very good direction as as John Wentworth said you know we have done a lot of things right and we followed some lessons learned around the country uh, fortunately for us so good question thank you okay thank you very much for that and thanks for the for the call it's 153 we only have a few minutes left so if anyone is out there with the attendees we still got over 60 so right around the same level it's been a good conversation if you have a question please again raise hand or on the phone star nine i'll go back to some of the emails we've gotten ahead of time uh, from barbara in oak grove uh, thanks for offering this listening session. I appreciate the effort to communicate the, with the topic with everyone. It's obvious that the longer this stay at home order is in effect, the more people will become restless and displaced. The more people who are restless and displaced, the more desperate people become and violent crime increases. The longer this goes on, the more aggressive people become. And with that increase, people have found themselves with nothing left to lose, end quotes. What are my rights to prepare, protect, and defend myself if I should find myself a victim of a violent crime? Is there something that the Sheriff's Department can offer? Maybe a public webinar on how to keep yourself safe? Maybe offer suggestions on smart ideas to keep your homestead safe or how to stay safe when going to the store? Two months of a global shutdown is something that we never could have imagined. Violent life-threatening crimes in my neighborhood is also something I could never imagine. This topic is no longer an imaginary suspense movie this is a fact of life and it's a great disservice to ourselves to downplay the obvious. Who would like to take that? I think uh, I might turn to my colleague, Mr. John Wentworth and have him talk about the legal aspects of that first, if you wouldn't mind, John, and then I could uh, maybe pick up with the second part of that. Well, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk reality here. Uh, when we're when we're at risk of uh, danger, it is statistically far more likely that you're going to be at risk of danger from someone who is within your home. And I know this sounds like I'm beating the DV drum, but I am for a reason because it's true. Uh, you're more likely to be harmed by somebody you know than someone that you don't. And uh, absolutely, a, a person has every right to use whatever reasonable means they 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 have they need to defend themselves from a, from a reasonable threat. Um, but with that in mind, uh, especially if we're talking about something in the DV context, that's why I'm trying to share that there is so much help and hope for people before things get to that stage. Uh, I, I believe that people know when they're in danger. I believe that they know 
uh, when there's that risk that something bad could happen. And I would uh, implore anyone to call law enforcement, uh, call for help, call a family member before things get to that stage. Um, that all the services that I talked about earlier are open and available to you. And I, and I would urge you to take advantage of that. Is there a risk of danger from strangers? Absolutely, but statistically, statistically, stranger danger is overblown. And I wanna, and so I wanna, I wanna make sure that you and your family and your friends stay healthy and, and safe. And, and uh, so I would ask that you reach out for help before you, you need to reach out for help in some other way. And just from, uh, first of all, John, great job on that one. So uh, to follow up on what John had said, couldn't agree with you more. First thing, always, always call 911, uh, get on the phone. I can't tell you from a law enforcement pr perspective, we haven't seen an increase in, in those types of crimes. Uh, the other thing I want everybody to know is we have more deputies on patrol right now than we normally do. I want you to know that our school resource officers are, are not in school and they're out on patrol. We have an, a lot of other functions that we've shifted uh, folks to the patrol to make sure that we're, we are uh, a lot of folks out there right now. And if somebody needs help, we're going to get there quickly. And again, please call. The, the other thing I would strongly encourage, which is really also right up our alley, is our Public Safety Training Center. And, and we've had a number of callers about CHL. We offer classes on a regular basis about safety, use of a gun, uh, your rights about that, and would strongly encourage you to check out the website, look at uh, when the training center opens, we have a number of classes that help people really uh, make those decisions about using force. So uh, great questions, I hope we covered them. And uh, again, thanks for the qu great question. Thank you for that, uh, John and, and, and Sheriff Roberts. Uh, I'm going to go to one last question. We don't, we've gone through all the ones on the phone and we don't see hands raised, but we got one last email question. I'm just gonna follow up with you directly, Sheriff, because it's along lines what you talked about. From Ione in Milwaukee, what about increased patrols after dark in areas where increased calls and or burglaries have been reported? Sometimes just seeing an officer drive through an area is reassuring for those who are fearful and can serve to dissuade those who are looking to do something, thanks to the officers for being on the front lines. Do you wanna address that very quickly in the last minute here? Yeah, I think just, just quickly, and I think I got most of the question, but um, yeah. uh, as I said, we've moved people to patrol. We're trying to get, get patrol in areas uh, where there's a more of a potential. I mean, businesses that might be closed that are somewhat secluded, I want, I want those out there even considering breaking into that building to know that we are out there, we are on patrol, and our response times are absolutely amazing right now. So um, I guess, first of all, again, if you have a concern, a suspicious person or something going on, we want you to call 911 and want to be an immediate resource to you and are doing everything in our power to get there quickly and making sure that uh, we're there to keep our communities safe. So uh, again, thank you for the question. All right, thank you very much for that. Thank you for the question and thanks for the response. I see we're approaching two o'clock now. Uh, I, I'm happy to open, it, or to open it up to the panelists for just any last closing comments that anyone has. Ah, Commissioner Savas. Oh, you're on mute, sir. You're on, you're on mute, Commissioner. Yeah, just, just to respond briefly to the last caller, um, I, I can attest to, um, at least in our area, Oak Grove, that, um, and I don't know if it's a result of, of the uh, light rail line, but in the last few years, we have seen a lot more strangers in our neighborhood, and um, being on next door and watching and listening to some of the comments, it seems to be spiking. There's a, a concern, uh, Sheriff um, and, and the district uh, DA, um, just want to just point that out that in our area we have had a lot of reports and I think there are concerns uh, people that um, matter of fact even I think last weekend or last week uh, we had um, uh, three deputies show up uh, right across the street from my home uh, arresting someone uh, for um, stealing packages it looked I, I believe so it's a reality and I don't know if it's as prevalent in other areas of the county, but certainly in our area, it has really spiked um, the complaints and the concerns about that. So um, just wanna just thank everyone for, for participating. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Would anyone else like to give a closing comment? Yeah, just real briefly, I want to thank everyone for participating and please continue to reach out to any of us. We have excellent relationships with each other and we share information and working for you is our number one priority. Thank you. Sheriff Roberts. Oh, um, just a quick closing comment. And uh, one of the things that, that we strongly believe are the people that are most vulnerable in this situation today are our seniors. And they are isolated, they're alone. And I, what I would ask is neighbors that live around those individuals to pick up the phone and give them a call, see how they're doing. Uh, I want you to know that um, my undersheriff Angie Brandenburg initiated a program called the Community Care Initiative, and we're delivering food and a number of other things to seniors that are in isolation, that are alone, they're not alone, that we are here. We have an amazing team from Community Corrections to a number <clears> of other volunteers that can get that kind of service to you and we want to be that conduit so um, I'm asking people out there to reach out to your seniors next door and uh, let them know about our service I can't tell you I've had seniors call and say that they thought it was a scam um, that have them go to our website it is not a scam we can bring uh, food and a number of other things uh, directly to your home and want to provide that service so uh, again, thanks, uh, uh, Dylan, for having this event. Well, no, thank you. Uh, Judge Steele. Thank you, Dylan. I just wanted to mention that um, the courthouse, because we don't have so many people here and we have a lot of people working remotely, like they do in the district attorney's office as well, we have telephone numbers and email addresses where you can respond and people will get back to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, DA Wentworth, are you good? Or I'll, I'll just add, uh, I, I want to reiterate that every phone number that you had that worked before uh, to get help works now. So please take advantage of it if you need it. Uh, we're here to help. We're just doing it in a, in a more spread out fashion, but we're here for you. All right. My thanks to Commissioner Sonia Fisher, Commissioner Paul Savas, Presiding Judge Kathy Steele, Sheriff Craig Roberts, and Deputy District Attorney John Wentworth for joining us today. We will have another listening session next week. I believe it's set for next Wednesday. The topic to uh, come out probably tomorrow, but it will be on mental health and wellness. So thank you all for joining us. Goodbye.